If you've been listening to the Business of Biotech podcast for a while now, you'll recall that Aaron Harris has joined me to co-host a few episodes. Aaron's my friend, colleague, and chief editor over at sellandgene.com, and she just recently launched a podcast of her own. It's aptly named Sell and Gene, the podcast. And if you're working in the Sell and Gene space, you should give it a listen. It's a collection of interviews with the industry and academic leaders moving the space forward. And you can find it at sellandgene.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Sell and Gene, the podcast. Check it out. Welcome back to the Business of Biotech. I'm Matt Piller, and my guest today is Dr. Arthur Zianibis. Did I get that right? Zianibis. There you go. All right. Who's been president and CEO at Homology Medicine since 2016. He's a UNH PhD grad that is postdoc at Harvard Med School and stayed on there as an associate professor of medicine for some 15 years before he jumped into industry first into big bio at Shire and later into the new and emerging biotech space. Dr. Zianabis serves on the boards of uh, the UNH College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and Stoke Therapeutics, and he chairs the board at ACUIS. For its part, homology is doing some pretty great things in the AAV gene therapy and gene editing fields, and it's gene therapy monoclonal antibody plat- platform, GTX, MAB, which I'll ask Dr. Zianibis to expand on, is also very exciting. In early studies, its AAV HSC vectors are demonstrating the capacity to incite the liver to produce and deliver fully functional monoclonal antibodies at sustained expression for up to 20 weeks, which could positively disrupt both the way we think about monoclonal antibody therapies and vastly expand the therapeutic targets for gene therapies. So we'll talk about that, but also unique to uh, Dr. Zianabos and uh, his company are the fact that they're betting big on the massive market forecasts for the field, and they're putting their chips down on their own soil. Homology is building its company from the ground up, investing in its own manufacturing facilities, and feverishly acquiring the talent to staff those facilities. So here to talk with me about all this and more is Dr. Arthur Zianabos. Arthur, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. It's a uh, great intro and you nailed the pronunciation of my last name perfectly. Um, all right. Well, don't 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 set the standard too high because I'm sure to mess it up as we roll through the, the conversation. So I want to start uh, just just getting to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, as I mentioned, your your background is, is super intriguing. You, it, it looks as though, on paper anyway, you had a pretty comfortable position at Harvard Medical uh, as an academic, um, and then you jumped into big bio at Shire um, back in 05, I think you made that move. So tell us about that. What what prompted that, that move? Yeah, it was a big career decision for me. I had uh, built up actually two labs at Harvard, one at the Channing Lab, um, which is associated with the Brigham and Women's. Uh, and another uh, in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Biology, um, which was on the quad at, at the medical school. Um, one was focused on vaccine development, very, very relevant for today. Uh, and the other was focused on T-cell uh, regulation of kind of the microbiome as it's come to be known now. So, so going back, uh, you know, almost 30 years now, uh, working in, in areas that are very relevant uh, today scientifically, uh, and also did a, a lot of work on the T cell uh, side on these uh, co-stimulatory molecules like PD1, PDL1, which are now you know known as Keytruda and, and and other drugs that are helping cancer patients. I'm very proud of the work early on we did uh, back then. Um, it was really driven my desire to 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 work in science um, by my upbringing. Uh, my dad uh, was a, a local family doc, uh, first generation Greek American in Manchester, New Hampshire, which um, in the local parlance is Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> and I followed him around to the hospital and ba- basically became the Greek community there. They're a kind of local position. They gathered the money for him to go to medical school and to pay back that debt. He came back and took care of him. And uh, I've always been intrigued by trying to help uh, people who uh, are suffering from disease. And uh, that led to my academic work uh, for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really 
why I transitioned to uh, industry. So in 2005, I had the opportunity to join um, a small uh, rare disease company known as TKT. And as I was transitioning over my lab and everything, Shire came in and acquired them. And oh. basically, my job uh, was we had at that time one rare disease drug on the market, XUS, making $60 million a year. And my job was to build a pipeline of drugs like that behind it. And that was my initial um, foray. But I had always in academia had done a lot of basic research and translated that, that research to licenses. So I did a lot of licenses to companies. I actually had a lot of collaborations with companies. I liked that work a lot because I felt like, um, you know, drug development is very hard and it takes a lot of different disciplines. And I felt a little bit limited at Harvard um, to try to kind of accomplish my goal of translating all the way into the clinic and, and commercialization. So I decided to kind of uh, uh, join forces with, uh, with Shire uh, and start developing drugs all the way through to commercialization and, and had a great run there for uh, close to 10 years. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, and I've I've heard that refrain before from you know academics turned uh, turned turned industry execs uh, the desire to you know kind of scratch that entrepreneurial itch uh, and yeah it sort of um, I guess build on their ability to to do what they were meant to do and 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 that's you know ser- serve and help. Um, so at, at what point did that sort of entrepreneurial bug really step in? Because I mean, you know, working in academia and and licensing, um, you know, doing those deals is one thing, but then taking on the risk, right, of of saying, okay, I'm going to put a stake in the ground uh, and I'm going to go all in on this. Um, was it, did that come naturally to you? And at what point did it sort of really settle in? Yeah, uh, the answer is no, it didn't come naturally because usually I'm a grinded out kind of person. Uh, and I had been at Harvard for 15 years, as you pointed out and was doing quite well there. I had two NIH grants and on my way. And then, you know, this opportunity, I, I kept getting presented with opportunities with, with a number of companies along the way and kept saying no. And then I just decided like it was time. I, it, you know, I, I had a lot of um, input from families and, and friends who said, you know, this is what you're meant to do really. And uh, I, took the, I took the leap uh, into it, uh, with a lot of trepidation, I have to be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. because I really didn't know how it was going to go. Uh, I had been used to kind of leading my own team. I had been used, I mean, I'm a team player, uh, based on my whole makeup, but I'd been used to kind of having, you know, my say as to how it goes and how I was going to blend into the industrial environment where you really need to be collegial, you need to work across functions, you need to build consensus, you need to do all these things to, to drive something through into the clinic and then commercial. Um, you know, I, I was a little bit worried about my ability to do that, to be honest. Yeah. With you. Yeah. So 15 years later, I can say that I think it's worked out okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, one of the one of the aspects I think I hear folks uh in, in your position when they first make that leap, they they struggle with most is perhaps the I don't know if I don't know if the the correct term would be salesmanship, but 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 effectively you are right. Like you're your your chief chief cheerleader. I mean chief 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 yeah. salesman when it comes to finance, when it comes to you know VC uh, capital, uh, you know rallying the troops, uh, influencing the board, right? Like that's all stuff that in academia maybe maybe you don't get to exercise those muscles too much. Yeah, that's true. I, I would say all those things are required. Uh, in a, in a job like I had at Shire, and I was in different roles there, and certainly this job. But I'll tell you something: um, fighting for space and money uh, at Harvard, uh, and and dealing with the politics there also yeah. taught me a lot. Uh, okay. A lot of times, uh, I would say, "You think this is like politically challenging? This is like kindergarten compared to what you know I had to deal with at Harvard." Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I certainly don't want to. Right. Yep. Yeah, don't don't want to underestimate the you know the the tough skin you grew there. Um, so you've been at, at homology since uh, since its inception, effectively 2015, 2016 kind of time frame. Right. Um, so so how did that specific role uh, come about? Yeah, so you know uh, my last role at Shire um, was as head of research and early development, and I was working really closely with our BD group 
uh, looking to acquire technologies because I'm I, I'm here at a, a company that successfully developed and commercialized you know four or five uh, enzyme replacement therapies for rare genetic disorders. But I'm thinking, hey, this is, this is there's a future out there where there's going to be treatments that come on board that are one and done, uh, gene therapy, gene editing, and and we need to kind of bring those in house and understand the power of, of that technology. So we we actually did a number of in licensing deals for antisense molecules, gene therapy. Uh, I worked very closely with the venture arm of Shire and Gwen Mellencoff there. We made uh, venture investments in Bluebird early, early days, 2010, 2011, you know, just mm -hmm. as that company was starting. Early investments in Sangamo and their gene editing. So I became familiar and very um, much appreciated the potential of those kind of um, approaches to treating rare genetic disorders and very passionate about bringing something to, to these patients that you know, they can benefit for the rest of their lives. And um, that led me to really discover the gene therapy, gene editing field. Uh, and, and at that time I was introduced um, to Kush Pamar, who is uh, a venture partner uh, at 5AM Ventures, who, who I met and he introduced me to this technology using a, using a, a family of AAD vectors that actually had the ability to do both gene therapy and gene editing. So you could actually put genes into uh, the chromosomes of cells. And I was fascinated by that. And I thought it was a great way um, to, to, to kind of realize the power of that uh, platform. And so, um, you know, we, we pulled in uh, my, my colleague, Albert Seymour, uh, who's our chief scientific officer today at Homology, and he and I, uh, worked very closely together at Shire. Uh, and we basically launched the company on this technology back in um, March of 2016. Company had been formed already, but we kind of were the you know first couple of employees there and, and built the company up from there. Yeah. So you're going on, you know, going on going on year six, right? Effectively. Um, what what's your what, what does the company look like today? How many employees do you have? Yeah, so we have 215 employees. Uh, we're headquartered in Bedford, Mass, right outside of uh, Boston. Uh, and, you know, we're sitting in a building uh, that we call the world headquarters of uh, homology uh, that um, houses all our activities, R&D activities. But importantly, as you mentioned, we have built our own uh, in-house manufacturing capability. And we can talk a lot about that. So I'm really proud of, um, of the team we've built uh, here and, you know, top notch people all very committed to the mission of the company and you know and i and i think you know the goal is to continue to grow uh the company um and in that short period of time we've taken a technology that came out of you know an academic lab and we will by the end of this year have three different clinical programs uh ongoing so we've moved pretty quickly um and i think executed really well um in terms of you know taking kind of nascent technology and moving it all the way into patients. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I want to dwell there for a minute, 215 employees, um, you know, in, in six short years, moving a nascent technology into, into something real. Um, the fact that, you know, a few years ago, this was a nascent technology and there, there wasn't necessarily a glut and remain, you know, the, the problem remains, there's not a, a glut of, of talent in this space. You know, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to go out there and staff up 215, build a manufacturing facility, get them all to work and, 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 and working competently. So to the degree that you can, if we can talk a little bit about that strategy, that, that growth strategy around the people aspect uh, to begin with, um, you know, what, what have you, how, how have you gone about attracting and retaining that, that talent? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the keys is building a really great network. Uh, and I've been, you know, around town for 30 years and met a lot of people in, in Cambridge, Boston area. As you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of talent here. There's, you know, over 66 colleges, uh, yeah. and universities in, in the area, but, you know, it's got some powerhouse places that produce some really smart people. Um, and, and I've really kind of relied on my network and my, my team's network to bring people on board. And I think, you know, what we try to build is a company that's very, you know, heavy on the culture of, of helping people uh, who otherwise can't be helped. 
uh, and really building on, uh, you know, people that I've worked with uh, before mm -hmm. and led before. And I think, uh, you know, that's really helped us and, and my team, very similar like-minded folks uh, have their own networks. And that's really how we cobbled together, I think, a really top-notch team of 215 people who um, are just really all dedicated and committed to bringing these transformative uh, treatments to, to patients who don't have them right now. So I, I think it really does um, rely on one's own kind of uh, mission and, and, and communicating that mission and that, and that goal to people uh, and get them to really buy in and believe. And I, and I think that's what you, you will find here at Homology is folks that are really here um, because of the mission, but also because of the people. Mm -hmm. and people feel that, uh, you know, as they come in the door, their first couple of weeks, I'll check in on them and say, hey, how's it going? Oh, everybody's been great. It's been really a collaborative environment. Um, and, and that's important. And that, that, that gives you the stickiness in your employee base that you really need, especially today with, you know, a very competitive environment out there for talent. And yeah. As it relates to, um, you know, the ability to recruit people who are ready to go, right, who can hit the ground running, um, I, I'm interested in, in what you see, what, what, what's changed over the past six years, what's gotten better. And I ask that because I've had plenty of conversations with leaders of, of uh, gene, uh, selling gene companies who, who kind of told me, you know, when we got started, the expectation was that we would bring in really smart people who, you know, perhaps grew up in a different space who could apply what they knew in that space and, and learn as, as we moved along, because there was a lot to learn, right? And, I, and I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that that's still the case in, in many aspects. However, you know, as you've grown through this through the past six years, um, so, so does academia, right? So do courses of study that, that folks are coming out of school with. Um, so does the field in general. So when you look at competitors that perhaps you want to snipe some uh, <laughs> some talent from, um, you know, they've they've come along. So so have you seen re real change in, I guess, the uh, preparedness of potential recruits and, and the folks that you're bringing on board over the over the course of the last six years? Um, and, and again, I, I fully acknowledge that it's still not easy pickings, so, so to speak. Uh, but but do you, do you see some change kind of happening in, in that regard? Absolutely, see that at uh, the the more junior level. So uh, undergrads coming out of uh, a science program at any one of the universities around here are much more prepared now today than six years ago to jump right in, hands on in the lab, versus six ten years ago where you have to do a, a fair amount of training mm -hmm. and. You know, it's one of the reasons why I joined the uh, College of Life Science and Agriculture board at UNH. UNH is very well known and respected for the quality of the students that come out of those science programs and their ability to really jump right in to uh, an environment in biotech. Whereas six, seven years ago, you'd be very cautious about doing something like that. So I've seen the programs morph along and be much more hands on and practical, um, you know, to the point where. You know, they really understand kind of the the um, the, the inner workings of biotech. Uh, you know, in the old days, you know, you came out with a with a bachelor of science. I went to Boston College here in town, yeah. um, and it was like you're going to medical school uh, or you're going to graduate school, uh, and that was it. That that was pretty much like your your options um, because it, it would be almost impossible for you to get a job straight out of uh, an act, uh, an undergraduate program. And go straight into a company, almost impossible. Yeah, uh, yeah. and so now that's that's really changed. And I, and I do I do also espouse the, the the concept of hire good smart people and 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 they'll learn. And and we see that throughout our organization. And the other thing that we've tried to do is make sure people have you know develop their careers within the organization, so that you have somebody who you know is a bench scientist. We've got folks that were bench scientists that are in program management or they're in regulatory now or they're so getting them to move around the organization and, and certainly I was very fortunate and benefited from that at Shire I moved into running program management for Shire um, I didn't know anything about program management when I when I went from head of discovery to doing that but um, the president of the company was 
it was like, hey, these are your programs that are moving into development. You might as well, you know, uh, oversee them from the program management seat. Um, so there's a lot to be said for that aspect. I think that we do well here um, at Homology also. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, I, I don't know that the struggle, it, it's great to hear that, uh, you know, that, that, that there's a, a, a more well-prepared workforce uh, coming out of academia and, and, and industry. Uh, I don't, I don't know that the crunch is going to get any easier to deal with given the growth forecast for this space. I mean, you know, you, it's, I, I, I rarely put a whole bunch of stock in analyst forecasts, but th- this one, you know, gene editing, gene therapy, uh, it's without a doubt. Um, you know, I've seen reputable sources pegging it at upwards of 20% CAGR over the next five years. Um, so a few questions on that, starting with, I mean, do, do you think like if if we're looking at 20, 20 plus percent CAGR, we see, you know, new companies popping up all the time, new uh, manufacturing facilities popping up all the time, new CDMO uh, facilities popping up all the time. Um, if, if we're growing that fast, uh, can, can we grow that fast? Do we have the people to grow that fast? Well, I think I, I agree with the projection is going to be very rapid growth. And a lot of it has to do with a lot of companies forming. Um, and the reason a lot of companies are forming is because there continues to be great science being done at these academic universities, but, um, there's also a lot of capital out there. Right. So there's a lot of VCs who have, you know, raised huge funds uh, that are able to seed those kind of companies uh, now. Um, and I do worry about whether we have the ability to keep up, even in a town like Boston. And, you know, I've been reading like, you know, there's going to be other biotech hubs in addition to San Diego, San Francisco and New York. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at Austin, Texas or Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, there's other of these hubs that are starting to spread up that are really um, based on university ecosystem in those towns. And so that's what you're starting to see now. But I, we do absolutely see a real uh, competitive environment now um, with particularly the, the more junior folks that are coming in the door um, who've got three offers in their hands and they're asking you for um, a pretty sizable starting salary. Sure. And, and equity and um and you got to just keep rolling with it so it's it, it's definitely a challenge yeah you mentioned the capital markets um so a, a, a friend and, and frequent guest on my show is alan shaw who's a pretty active financial guy in the in the biotech space um and every now and then you know we we, we have these conversations about the fact that there's just you know money everywhere a lot of people with their hands out but a lot of people doling the money out too um and every now and then he expresses uh he hints at concern around the sustainability of of those capital markets. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, what I'm seeing are earlier and earlier stage kind of science uh, get funded uh, in terms of, you know, you're building a company around it. And and I just had this conversation with a colleague last night, uh, you know, around what's getting funded, what companies are getting started based on the science and how many of them are really going to make it. it? You know, you really need to show, I think early uh, for something to be successful developability, right? So it, you can have the coolest science in the world, um, but translating that science into something that actually can potentially become uh, a clinical program or a commercial drug uh, is, is difficult. And I think that's a challenge because we've got all these different gene editing technologies that are coming out, you know, CRISPR, 1.0, 2. I think we're up to 5.0 at this point, mm-hmm. um, and and it's all an improvement on the original kind of concept. Um, so you wonder how the CRISPR 1.0, 2.0s are going to are going to fare. Um, just to use them as an example, but I see this across you know immuno oncology. I see it in different fields as well. Um, definitely, the newer science is is, is getting uh, funded. The 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 issue there is, and and, and now putting my former academic hat on, the funding for science at the universities has gone way down from the NIH point of view. And that ecosystem is probably going to collapse if we don't beef that up. Um, A a good number of academics now really are working closely with companies for their funding just to keep that pipeline going. And and companies do recognize this and have set aside a good chunk of money, you know, some of the big companies to really start funding that kind of research because they re- recognize that that pipeline 
is slowing down uh, uh, the number of new ideas. So I, I think there is some cracks in the infrastructure, if you will, uh, along those lines. The Business of Biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at citivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Also related to capital, you know, you take a company like yours, uh, you know, f- f- I- I'll ask you at what point in your, you know, six year sort of continuum to date, I know you said there was some formation activity prior to that, that's that six year mark, but at, at what point did you put a stake in the ground? And this is going to relate to, you know, your, your uh, finance structure. At what point did you put a stake in the ground and say, you know what, um, we're going to, we're going to invest in manufacturing capacity in-house, you know, we're going to staff that up and, and we're going to, you know, take, take that risk, right? Like at what point did, did, did that kind of come to come to pass where you're like, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a combination of things. So it was about two years into actually running the company. So 2017, early 2018 timeframe where we felt like we were on the right track with our lead program in PKU uh, gene therapy. And we had really demonstrated in vivo proof of concept around our gene editing approach. Mm-hmm. And so I, I felt like, okay, we're truly going to be not just another gene therapy company, but we're going to be, uh, you know, have two, uh, two platforms or dual platforms, if you will, a gene, a gene therapy platform and a gene editing platform. Um, and then pile on top of that, my experience in going through, um, multiple manufacturing uh, shortages issues, particularly in 2008 when Genzyme really struggled uh, with their Alston plant. And then Shire kind of got dragged into that because we had uh, drugs for those two patient populations, the Gaucher patient population, the Fabry patient population. And I was kind of thrust into the middle of it from the Shire point of view, um, trying to manage, you know, how do we get drug to patients who now don't have access to, to drug? And the FDA worked really closely with us to help out um, it just made a huge impact on me is what can go wrong when you kind of hit that stumbling block in manufacturing. So then if you translate that to AAV manufacturing, which is very nascent in, in where we are, it just made all the sense in the world to me to make that investment in, in infrastructure and people because having control over the quality of your uh, product is hugely important. And, and I'm seeing this now play out in a number of situations where companies are relying on third-party manufacturers that are way behind in their timelines. You've got the FDA that's really, really tightening up the specifications for gene therapy because there's been uh, a few safety issues that have popped up in this field uh, over the last couple of years. And the bar is really getting raised. So, so having control over your destiny is so important because the worst thing that can happen to you is for through no fault of your own is fall behind a timeline and have to communicate that externally, particularly, particularly if you're a public company. Um, and I didn't ever want to be in that situation. And thankfully we have not. And so uh, that I think were, you know, were some of the reasons that led to that decision back in 2017. And we couldn't be more pleased that we made that decision today. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to revisit sort of that, that thought process and uh, process and the execution back in 2017. I mean, you, you know, you just mentioned that you, you never want to find yourself in a position where you need to communicate that we're way behind our timelines. And then that's due in large part to, you know, capacity at the CDMO level uh, or CMO level. Um, at the same time, avoiding that conversation requires a whole bunch of conversation at the point where you say, you know what, we need money. <laughs> we need resources to, to build this, this, this infrastructure, to build this manufacturing capacity and, and staff it up and manage it in-house. Um, so, so how, how did you like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't expect you to name names, Dr. Zianavis, but how, how did you go about, uh, you know, sort of rallying the troops 
And again, hearkening back to that comment I made earlier around salesmanship as as the leader of the company, yeah. um, you know, convincing investors that this wasn't uh, wasn't as big a risk as it might look like on paper, or convincing the board that that this was the direct route to go. Because, and I've said this multiple times on this very podcast. Uh, it seems like I'm, I'm more often than not talking to leaders of, of cell and gene therapy companies who are saying like, there's no way we could ever possibly think about doing this in-house. But then for every, you know, three or four of those folks, there's one who's like, there's no way that we could ever possibly think about not doing this in-house. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to suss all that out, like wh- wh- where that kind of crux is, where you fall on either either side of that fence. But um what did you have to do as a leader of the company? That's a, I use a lot of words, but the, ultimately the question is, what did you have to do at that point? What challenges did you face? How did you have to, you know, what challenges did you have to overcome to put the shovel in the ground, so to speak? Yeah, it, it was um, it was significant. And I, I was very fortunate to have um, backers like uh, 5AM, Arch, uh, and, you know, that, that really kind of led the Series A that, that got it. I think obviously, look, you can talk all you want and you can sell all you want, but you got to put your money where your mouth is. We had to have data and we did have, you know, very strong preclinical data on uh, gene therapy and gene editing. So proving that to, to um, our own investors was very important. And then we went out and raised a series B, uh, which was a sizable series B, um, you know, with on the, on the back of that, you know, very strong preclinical data. Uh, and the fact that, that as a team, we executed really, really well uh, to get to that point. And I think we demonstrated our, our track record there. And that helped with those conversations. And then it's it's all about, uh, you know, telling investors that, you know, investing in this is really going to lead to a much quicker timeline, a much, uh, you know, cleaner ability to hit those timelines, and ultimately creating a lot of value in the company. Um, because you know, we sat back three, four years ago, knowing that the bar is going to get raised on a the manufacturing, you know, CMC uh, specifications and analytics. Mm-hmm. We we could predict that. We we based on our experience had seen that in biologics over and over and over again, and we knew that A B was going to go through the same thing. So getting ahead of that, I think that vision uh, really kind of. Um, made a significant impact on, on uh, additional investors who came into the company at that time. And that's paid off. Uh, and so I think um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, put up or shut up. Uh, and we were able to kind of walk that line and, and get to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. One of the advantages, I think, with a, a, a therapeutic like those or therapeutics like those that you're working on um, in your position is that you don't necessarily need, you know, half a million square feet, right? Like you don't need see you know, ch- chains of great big giant, you know, 2000 liter bioreactors and so on and so forth. Um, so now you have this 25,000 square foot GMP facility. Um, what's in it? What, what, you know, what kind of walk us through what, what's in that space? What kind of tech are you, are you running there? Sure. And, uh, you know, and you're absolutely right. In gene therapy, you need a fraction of the space you would need to make a monoclonal antibody or an enzyme replacement therapy. And the team that we have here, uh, led by Tim Kelly, you know, who is the head of tech ops at Shire, and was part of the team that built out that gigantic plant there that you see on uh, Route 2 and uh, 128. Um, here, I mean, basically with 25,000 square feet, we have a three by 500 liter uh, bioreactor uh, system in, in multiple suites. And we are going all, we've gone all the way up to a 2000 liter uh, bioreactor, uh, which is the highest in the industry. We had that also in a suite in our, our manufacturing facility. You also need process development lab space. So early, so you need the two liter, 50 liter bioreactors and, and the early work that goes into vector optimization uh, and manufacturability. But we have all that here in-house, um, which really, really does help us, you know, keep our timelines and make sure uh, that we're uh, on it in terms of manufacturing. Yeah. That's very cool. All right. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what's being manufactured. What, you know, what, what, what that process development activity is, uh, is focused on and, and, and where the manufacturing, uh, capacity will be put to use. Uh, you know, I mentioned from, from the outset, uh, I'm particularly being, um, the business of biotech, right. Produced by bioprocess online, 
all things biologics are are our our bailiwick, uh, cell, cell and gene therapies, gene editing uh, therapies included. Um, but when you start throwing, you know, the the impact of of gene therapies on the the map space, you know, that really piques my interest. So I do want to I I want to get some more detail on that platform, but I don't want to, you know, I, I want to give the floor to you to tell me about all the programs you're working on. But uh, th- that that is particularly interesting to me. Yeah, uh, and it's very interesting to us as well. Um, you know, the programs that we have ongoing right now is we're at a phase two uh, with our PKU gene therapy uh, program. That's on the heels of uh, positive data from our dose escalation phase to identify you know, doses to bring forward into a large number of patients. And we're recruiting and enrolling and dosing patients there now. Um, we also have guided uh, to the fact that we will have uh, started a uh, a gene therapy program for a disease called Hunter syndrome, uh, which is a monogenic lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, and that's a disease that a lot of us here uh, have worked on at our days at Shire and, and developed an enzyme replacement therapy. We think we can really improve on that and give patients a one and done approach versus a weekly infusion. Uh, and then our first editing program is for the pediatric population of PKU. And the reason we're using editing uh, in that population is because you know, these kids find out a day after they're born, they have PKU. The parents find out. Uh, it's on the newborn screen panel. And, you know, the key in that, in this disease is to really intervene as early as you can, because right out of the gate, these kids are losing IQ points and executive function capabilities. So we're starting in adults right now with gene therapy, but ultimately with gene editing, we want to go earlier. And with gene editing, you can go directly and make that correction of the genome uh, with our gene editing approach in a very precise way based on homologous recombination. You want to do that because very early in the life of a child, by the time they're 15, their liver, liver doubles 15, 16 times. So that you have the potential to kind of wash out a gene therapy approach. That's not direct insertion into, into the chromosome. So that's why we have both arms of that. And we can kind of use both arms of that, uh, of our platform for different diseases where you have rapidly dividing tissue. And then you alluded to our GTX MAP platform, and this is basically using our vectors to uh, deliver the cDNA that encodes for a full length IgG monoclonal antibody. Uh, and, and that's pretty rare because it's a very difficult uh, uh, construct to make. And we've shown very, very nice preclinical data publicly, uh, and we're writing this up now for publication, that shows the expression of an antibody in multiple animal models um, that is specific for complement C5. And that's the target uh, for diseases such as PNH. So this is basically uh, Alexion's monoclonal antibody, Solaris, and Mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, and the ability to have a, a constant level of anti- antibody that's made is very beneficial based on, on which target you, you pick. So you can have the continuous suppression of C5 in PNH patients versus if you give a monoclonal antibody, uh, you know, you're going to see a peak. And then after a while, you're going to see a trough. And then you got to give another injection and you see the peak and a trough. So it basically looks like a sine wave. Here, the gene therapy you have expression within three or four weeks, and you continue to make that antibody. You use the liver basically as an antibody producing organ, and yeah. that's very advantageous for certain monoclonal antibodies. There's, there's different targets where you don't want it on all the time, but for C5 uh, uh, knockdown and targeting, it's okay to have it on all the time. So we're really excited. There's a number of programs behind this one that are in early discovery, but we've named a clinical development candidate already. And that is entering into IND enabling studies right now. We're doing all the talks work. So the platform really, as you can see, is, has a lot of angles to it uh, that we're that we're uh, exploring and developing uh, as we go along. Yeah, I mean, and I could see you know, with, with those multiple angles. I mean, you know, if if you follow along, I'm trying to trying to follow along here from uh, sort of like a, there's there's an age timeline to follow. Like you're playing different angles on the you know the pa- patient age. You're playing different angles on biology itself, human biology. Um, I can certainly see why it's important to uh, uh, grow and add to that 215. I mean, it requires a lot of expertise to explore all those angles. Um, 
on that GTX map platform, uh, you know, you mentioned that it's it, it it's rare because it's it's difficult to do. It's challenging. Um, are, are there others in the in the spec? I mean, is, do you do you do you sort of see that as a as a nascent opportunity more industry wide as well? Not that I want you to give up the secret sauce if it's something that's proprietary and secret to uh, to homology. But what 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 do you sort of see as a, a forecast for that approach? Well, I think it is very nascent. There's a few companies that have embarked on this, but I think we're one of the only, if not the only company to be able to make a full length heavy and light chain monoclonal antibody. I've seen single chain, I've seen uh, FC, uh, and I've seen other approaches to try to knock down, but having a full length monoclonal antibody is pretty rare. So I do think that it's it's actually a very fertile area uh, for growth and it's something that we fully intend uh, to really uh, put a lot of focus on and develop in a number of indications. And, and I think even here, we can get out of just only, you know, rare only diseases. We can actually target larger diseases uh, mm -hmm. here as well. And ultimately be able to, you know, the goal is to be able to give one gene therapy infusion and have that patient pretty much be set for the rest of their lives. That's yeah. uh, versus going through uh, a daily or a weekly or a quarterly uh, dosing. Um, there's a chronicity uh, attached to that, 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 that's a patient burden that's not insignificant and the cost is not insignificant. So right. we're talking about, you know, paying for uh, Solaris, Sultimeris for uh, the rest of that patient's life. That's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so give it once and you're done. Yeah, the single dose aspect is certainly uh, obviously central to sort of the democratization of of, of, of therapeutics. Um, but I'm, I'm curious uh, about your, your, you know, any other approaches or, or thoughts around accessibility, patient centricity, and, and specifically from a cost perspective, what homology's approach is. You know, that's a if, when you when you get closer to the patient, you get closer to the payer. That's just a, a a daily and common conversation. Like this stuff is just it's just so expensive. Yeah. Um, so so what's your take on that? What's homology doing to sort of affect uh, that that situation? Yeah, I mean we're very well versed in in that conversation you just mm. referred to, uh, and then talking to payers and and key you know key opinion leaders, you know the key stakeholders um, is, is very important early on. We have a group already here. We're, you know, we're in the clinic with one program right now, uh, and we already have you know that group built up to be able to have those conversations early. And I think that's really, really important. And ultimately, we want to get to the point uh, where uh, you know the cost of goods here are very much more manageable than they are right now. And that comes with innovation on manufacturing, which is why we've invested. That's another reason why we've invested and we continue to innovate is to get the cost of making these drugs down. Uh, so that the cost ultimately to the patient is, is lowered and becomes much more uh, reasonable and recognizable. And I, I also think for these one and done therapies, you know, we, we need to really figure out a model where payers um, can kind of work with you. But right now, um, they're very used to the chronicity model. They have an annual budget and they have to hit that annual budget. If you're talking to them about a one and done, that kind of annual budget concept kind of goes out the window. So there's right. not there's been those that are that come out with their plans uh, that have already kind of been approved in gene therapy. Um, but I think we can do a better job there uh, as well moving forward to be able to try to work with the payers to get to a place where um, we can get these, these therapies to patients in a way that's that's not going to be onerous. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to, I think you sort of already asked the, or answered the question I wanted to ask around, you know, your, your, your thoughts around indications beyond you know, the, the current liver, liver eye sort of uh, approach that the gene therapy uh, is taking. You, you sort of answered that, though. I mean, if I, I you know, I, I look at the multifaceted approach that homology is taking, you know, to your point, even, you know, if, if you can if you can create a, a monoclonal antibody production facility out of a person's liver, you can do a lot of things with that. Right. It opens up a lot of a uh, lot of indication windows. Um, but, but any thought, I guess, any, any near term thoughts on where you might be moving next? Yeah, I think, you know, this last move we made with the GTX map, that, that is going to keep us plenty busy for the, the shorter term. So I yeah. think 
right now we're kind of you know in the kind of execution phase so that we can make sure we can show good progress on the three clinical programs we'll have in the clinic this year bring the gtx map uh program forward and again you know th that target uh c5 is pnh myasthenia gravis it's a target for a number of diseases uh auhs um, so you can have one drug for multiple indications. So I think we have our hands full right now, uh, yeah. I'm, for the next couple of years anyway. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So what is the next big step at homology? What's, uh, you know, what's on your immediate radar from a business perspective, you know, even moving outside the pipeline, what's on, what's on Dr. Uh, Zianibus's plate right now? Uh, a lot. Uh, so <laughs> We're actually executing on two INDs right now uh, to get these trials started and doing that concurrently. I don't think in my career that even at a big company like Shire, we were doing that uh, exactly over and one on top of the other. So that's consuming and has consumed a lot of our time. Uh, and right now with the FDA, there's a lot of conversations uh, ongoing, of course, around safety and efficacy, risk benefit profile. Um, so that's been uh, certainly uh, um, front and center for, for us uh, this year. And then, you know, getting ready to get these trials up and running off the ground is, is no uh, easy feat either. So the Hunter trial and the PKU gene editing trial, uh, we're getting ramped up. And then obviously, you know, continuing to move the GTX map pr program forward uh, as well. So a lot operationally. And then in the meantime, you know, I'm always paying attention to the culture of the company the structure of the company, what else can we be doing business-wise, what, what other assets are out there potentially that we could acquire. Um, so I'm always constantly scanning the universe for you know, ways to make sure that we keep our balance sheet strong, but also uh, make sure we continue to move the company forward from an innovation perspective. Yeah, yeah. Hands full indeed. What's your, what's your best advice for someone who is new to, to the role. Let's say, uh, you know, I, I like to say, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that you like your brother-in-law, right? That's maybe not a safe assumption to make, but I'm going to assume that you like your brother-in-law and your brother-in-law is kind of like short on the heels of, of what you're doing, right? Following in your footsteps, about to launch a, a company similar to yours. Um, you know, you just rattle off a lot of things that you're responsible for and that your team's responsible for and you're responsible for leading. But just it's a it's a hard question to answer, I know, but I'm putting you on the spot. What's your best advice for a guy who's kind of following in your in your lead? Actually, I think it's a pretty uh, easy question. You got to have a steel chin, basically. Uh, you're going to take your lumps, and you're going to take your punches, and you got to get up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward. And you know, this is not an easy um, an easy field uh, to see, succeed in. You're 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 trying to take biology and coerce it into um, a treatment for patients who really need them. And, and getting across all those hurdles along the way, uh, there's so many factors that go into it. You're gonna take your lumps and you gotta keep your chin up and you gotta keep moving forward. Uh, and and my, my background in hockey has really paid off because I learned out as, as not a very stout individual, I took a lot of lumps uh, growing up and playing hockey. So my nose got broken more than a couple of times. Uh, that That's probably my best advice is just, just be determined and keep your feet moving and keep moving forward because it's not going to be easy. Well, that's great advice. I appreciate that. And by the way, your your nose, I mean, I'm looking at you right now. You'd never know. Your nose looks great. Uh, no, it actually, if I, if I moved it around... <laughs> It, the, the viewership of this podcast would go straight down if I. All right. Well, going, please, how malleable my nose is after uh, you know eighteen years of hockey. So yeah. Well, please refrain from touching your nose. Then we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh, it's been great talking with you, Doctor Zianabis. I appreciate it. Thanks for making the time for us and uh, and sharing some insight with our audience. I think it was uh, time time well spent for sure. Great. Thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure to be on. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, my pleasure. So that's homology medicines, uh, Dr. Arthur Zianabis. Now, for those of you following along uh, on audio who can't see the spelling, just so you're aware, if you want to look them up, it's T-Z-I-A-N-A-B-O-S, but it's pronounced Zianabis. So there you go. Uh, I'm Matt Piller. This is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership 
with Cytiva, which offers a host of great resources for new and emerging biotechs at CytivaLifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. We offer a host of great resources for emerging biopharmas too. You can find us at bioprocessonline.com where I invite you to subscribe to my newsletter. Hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you did hit that subscribe button, give us a review and we'll see you next week. In the meantime, thanks for listening.